Well, good evening. Welcome to our Bible study for May the 10th, 2023. We are continuing tonight our discussion on um, Jesus as uh, just Jesus' statement of himself as I am the bread of life. Our core scripture is coming from John chapter 6, verses 27 through 59. The bread of life is what Jesus claimed to be, what Jesus described himself as being. And there were several I am statements that Jesus made because it was important to him that people understand just who he was. Let's start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come tonight just so grateful to be able to be in your presence tonight. Lord, we thank you for keeping us into May of 2023. Father God, you are such a good God. So much is going on in the world, so much chaos, so much violence, Lord God. But you allowed us, Lord, to be able to come together for this quiet time of study. And we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your, your, your patience with us, Lord. That you love us, that you, you care about us, even though you know who we are and all the good, the bad, and the ugly. And you love us anyway. Lord, we just want to say thank you. We pray, Holy Spirit, you will be our teacher tonight, that you will guide and direct our thoughts and our, our discussion and the words that, that go forth, Lord. Lord, let this be a way of, of clarifying your word, Lord God, so that uh, your, your scriptures can be embedded in our hearts so that we cannot stay the same. Lord, we pray your blessing on this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, now, last week we started talking about bread and its importance to human society. We said that uh, every people group, every culture around the world has some form of bread. And they're all different types and so forth. But bread is a staple in every culture, which is why it is so um, enlightening that Jesus would use that as a way to describe himself because everybody understands that. You know, if you don't get bread, if you don't get water, you're pretty soon you're going to fall apart. That a bread is a bread is a staple, a, a core of the the nourishment of all people. When the the Hebrews were wandering in the wilderness, the Lord didn't rain down salad for them. He rained manna, which they turned into a form of bread that they could eat on a daily basis. So Jesus says, "I am the bread of life." He wanted people to know. Who he is. And we know that bread is a basic, a basic for human nourishment, nutrition. But our focus is also on the idea that there is a difference between fullness and satisfaction. I think I gave an example last week where um, uh, you wake up in the middle of the night and you have a taste for something and you go to the cabinet and you're looking for whatever. You're not sure what it is, but you, 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 you try this. You may have some chips. That's not it. You have a cookie. That's not it. Um, you look in the freezer. Maybe there's some ice cream and you taste it. That's not it. So there is, a, there is a, a, a hunger there. There's a taste there, but you're not quite sure what will satisfy so many times, at least in my experience, I have gone ahead and had something and eat it anyway, and then you've just gone back to bed. It's not satisfied, but you've filled up on something, okay? Well, deep inside, we can be driven by the need for more. When fullness is a priority, it may be difficult to appreciate and enjoy what one already has. Like I said before, we can be full and not satisfied. We can be full and still looking for that, but, but that just wasn't quite what I had a taste for. We can be full 
and not satisfied. In Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, we have a story about the lepers. There were 10 lepers. And the story says um, that there were 10 of them who cried out to Jesus for healing. And he healed them. Uh, the story of the one leper and the nine embodies this idea. The nine were chasing to return to life without stopping and returning to appreciate what they had. In Luke 17, 15 and 16, it says, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice and glorified God. He fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So we have this image of 10 men who had a horrible disease. They were outcasts from society. They were not allowed to, to uh, enter the temple. They were not even allowed to be in the presence of the other people in the village. They had to leave their homes. They had to go off and dwell by themselves. And I mean, their, their conditions were horrific. And they came upon Jesus and cried out to him for healing. And Jesus healed them. Now, nine of them, when they realized they were healed, took off and went to the temple so they could be declared healed, so they could return to their lives. But one, one recognized he was healed and he did something unusual. He stopped when he realized he was healed, according to the scripture. He turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. He fell down on his face at Jesus' feet and gave him thanks. And that one happened to be a Samaritan. Now, you know, the Samaritans and the Jews didn't get along with each other. They had issues with each other. But this one, who was not a Jew, a Samaritan, stopped when he was healed and bowed down and thanked Jesus. He glorified God and thanked Jesus for his healing. And um, I was looking for it, for that verse because there was another part that I wanted to share with you. Luke 17. Um, 17 and 17 says, And Jesus answering said, where, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Because there was just one who came back and said thank you. And 18 says, there are not found that return to give glory to God, except for this stranger. And Jesus said to him, arise, go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. Okay, okay. So there were 10 healed. Nine of them went on their way and didn't even look up, didn't say thank you, Jesus, nothing. Just kept moving. But this one, this Samaritan, turned around, glorified God, thanked Jesus. And Jesus said to him, thy faith has made thee whole. He didn't say thy faith made thee well. He didn't say thy faith cured thee. He said, thy faith hath made thee whole. Which means this Samaritan got more than a healing. He got a wholeness. So whatever it was in his life, not just his illness, but whatever it was, maybe broken relationships, maybe loss of finances, loss of his home, Jesus said, you are whole. That means everything is covered. Wow. Now, that in itself, that is in, in itself 
is, is a lesson to be learned. He was searching for something. He received it. And in receiving it, he acknowledged where it came from. Thy faith has made thee whole. So instead of just being made full, healed, he was made satisfied, contented, complete because of his response. Okay, we want to take a look at another situation. Uh, there was a man who was building more barns that, um, and that same thought process is what relates to this idea of looking for something, chasing something. In Luke chapter 12, verses 17 through 20, we have the story of a, a man who had been blessed. He had planted his fields. And they produced and produced and produced to the point that all the barns that he had were over full. He had, his, his land had, had produced so bountifully that his barns wouldn't even hold all that he harvested. So in Luke 12 and 17 it says, And he thought to himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. I have no place to put everything. And he said, this is what I'll do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? He was driven, he was chasing the more. He wasn't satisfied that the barns were full, overfull, overflowing. He was concentrating on, okay, what can I do to accommodate this? I'll build bigger barns. I'll accumulate more and more. That's not what God wanted. That's not the plan. And God said to this man, thou fool. Now, you know, we throw that word around a lot, you know, but in the Bible, fool has a very, very serious connotation. And for God to call him a fool, what you planning on doing? He said, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then, who's going to have all this stuff that you accumulate? Do you see the significance of that story? Many of us, I hate to say, many of us have spent our lives acquiring stuff. Many of us have spent our working lives, our, our uh, um, uh, uh, growing up years, our, our years of, of work and learning and, and, and putting aside and, and being wise with our finances and all of that. We have accumulated stuff. But you know what? There's going to be a time that we have to leave it. And that time is not on anybody's calendar. Because we don't know when that time is going to be. We never know. You don't have to get old and sick to leave here. So this message to the man who had built bigger and, and mightier barns, that's a message for us as well in terms of recognizing who we are and what we should be about. Because all of the stuff that we accumulate, at some point, somebody else is going to have to get rid of it, make use of it, benefit from it. That's a guarantee. Because you cannot take it with you. When you leave here, all of that stuff goes under somebody else's 
auspices. All of that stuff is under somebody else's control. That beautiful China that you set aside, that you spent years collecting. <laughs> Nobody cares about that. The, the home, the furniture, it's just going to be sold or somebody else will get it and mistreat it or whatever. So the message for us is what are we doing with what's being provided to us for the benefit of everlasting goodness? What are we doing with what comes our way that will benefit the kingdom? This man in our story had overabundance and in Instead of thinking what could be done for the good of others or for the good of mankind or for anybody else's benefit, he was just figuring out how he could store it up. And then he says to himself, oh, well, once I get that done, then I'm going to retire. I'm going to relax. I'm going to take my ease. I'm going to enjoy life. Probably not. If that was his mindset, he would probably get bigger barns and more of them, because that's, that's what human thought process is. But Jesus is saying, he is our source, and we should be aiming for uh, satisfaction, not just fullness. We should be aiming for purpose and fulfillment, not just the pleasure of the day. So we have our uh, Jesus proclaiming himself to be the bread of life. And there's a significance of the bread spiritually. The bread is sustenance and Christ is our sustenance. And sustenance is that which supports life, um, keeps things alive and nourished. That's what sustenance does. The word is born from the word sustained. The image is the idea of nourishment. Christ is our bread in that he is our spiritual vitamin. Philippians 4.19 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He is our spiritual victory in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our spiritual virtue, according to John 15 and 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. In Matthew 5, 13 through 16, it says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under the feet of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be healed. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Bread gives us strength, so it sustains us and it gives us strength. Ephesians 3 and 20 now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Jesus is the bread that provides us with strength, with the strength to abound. Jude 24 reads, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. This is Jesus. This is the bread that provides our strength 
He can keep us from falling. He can provide us with abundance of whatever it is we need. Jesus, our Savior, our bread, the bread is our Savior. He is our Redeemer in 1 Corinthians 6 and 20. For we are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And he is our reconciler. Colossians 1, 20 through 23. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, which was preached to every creature that is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, and made a minister. The idea of reconciling is the image of bringing things into balance. So Jesus proclaimed himself as bread. He said he was the bread of life. So he brings things into balance. He provides our strength and our sustenance. So he allows us to uh, be strengthened and sustained so that we can perform what we were placed here to do, the bread of life. So there are practices that go along with our satisfaction. Those practices that allow us to um, acquire the satisfaction that Jesus promises. And one of those things that uh, allow us to practice that satisfaction has to do with fasting. And when we think of fasting, we always think of not eating food or giving up something. Well, there are things um, that may get in the way of Jesus being our bread, and that's what we should fast from. Um, some of the things that interfere with Jesus being all that he should be in our lives. Our focus on success in worldly matters might be something we should fast from. There are things that get in the way of allowing Jesus to be our bread. Can you fast from being in need of control? Being in charge of stuff. It's got to be done my way on my time schedule. That's something we should set aside for a while and recognize that God is the one that is ultimately in control. Can you fast from allowing yourself to be pushed into conflict? Allowing yourself to be manipulated by other people's desires and plans. You know there are people in your circles that will start stuff up to stand aside and watch how it works out. They will start an argument or start a disagreement or start a, 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 a conflict just so they can see the participants go at each other. Well, that is something we need to be able to fast from. So when you see that friend who likes to keep stuff going coming your way, you might want to busy yourself in another direction. You might need to distance yourself from that person. Fast from maybe those kind of relationships. Can you fast from needing to be defensive or always on the offense? Can you step aside from giving excuses? Can you step aside from being uh, uh, trying to be in charge? Can you fast from that? If we can do that, it's possible that we can have more of that bread of life that Jesus claimed, says he is for us. He's there for us. 
It's not that it's just something he claims to be. That's who he is. But a lot of times we let stuff get in the way of us being able to gain that nourishment that we need from him. Uh, we let things get in the way of, of us being able to um, be sustained by the bread of life. Perhaps we could move from expecting to accepting. You know, there's a prayer that goes, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That's, they call that the serenity prayer. But the idea, if we are going to be sustained by the bread of life, might be that we become more willing to accept things as they are. Accept and appreciate what we have. Rather than always being on the lookout for getting more. I appreciate what has already been done for me. Lord, I thank you that I have the help I have. I thank you for what you've already done. I am so grateful for what you've already blessed me with. I'm not sitting here waiting on, well, what you're going to do for me now? What have you done for me lately? I think that was, was it Janet Jackson? Whatever. Anyway, God doesn't fit into that category. What have you done for me lately? Our job is to look at what he's already done. Because he's already done more than we deserve. He's already done for us what we could not do for ourselves. Move from expecting to accepting. I'm, a, I'm not sitting here wait, waiting for expecting that promotion. I'm sitting here thanking you, Lord, that I have the position I have. And I'm going to do this one so well because I appreciate that you allowed me to be here. I'm going to do this so well that when promotion comes along, it has to come my way because I'm doing what you put me here to do. I'm appreciating what you have already given me, what you've already done for me. I'm accepting what you've already done and not sitting here expecting what may come down the road. We can focus more on feeding others and ensuring you get fed spiritually. Our blessings come to us so they can be channeled to someone else. The blessings that we have were given to us, not just for us, but they were given to us to be passed on, passed through, like a conduit. You know that white pipe, that PVC stuff that you're in your drains? Well, that's there so that what's put in can pass through. What comes to us is not for us. Like our salvation, we were blessed to be saved. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation. But I wasn't saved just so I can go to heaven when I die. That's not what he saves us for. We are saved that we may point others to the Christ. That we might show other people, this is what Jesus is like. Jesus in me <laughs> is supposed to be on display. Not the big Bible that I carry, but the love and the joy and the peace and the, the long suffering and the patience. That's what should be coming through me to show Jesus to other people. Not uh, um, what I can get, but what I can pass on to others. Focus more on feeding others. What can I do for somebody else? That should be our focus. What can I do to make somebody else's day better? Maybe it's just giving somebody a smile, and that doesn't cost me. Maybe when I, when I go in the store and the line is long, I won't give the cashier a hard time. Maybe when I'm sitting at the railroad track waiting for that freight train to go past, I can call somebody on my cell phone and tell them uh, what a great day it has been for me and how are you today and, and uh, um, 
God is so good. I just was sitting here and I thought about you and I wanted to give you a call. Something. What have I done to bless somebody else? Because you know we are recipients of blessings every single day. And we are responsible for feeding others with those blessings we receive. And the feeding doesn't necessarily have to be something you put in your mouth. The feeding may be in the spirit. What can I pass on? Because truly, God blesses us in a mighty way. And perhaps we can learn to seek satisfaction and not just being full. To seek satisfaction and not just being full. And a key step to doing that comes to us from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It's a familiar scripture. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. We can seek satisfaction by trusting the Lord with our whole heart. Not leaning on what looks right to you or what you think or what your opinion is, but trusting in him in what his word says, and leaning not to our own understanding, acknowledging him in all our ways, acknowledging him in all that we do so that he can direct our paths. And then in Psalm 121, verse 1, it says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. I will lift up mine eyes to the hills, from whence cometh my help. For my help cometh from the Lord, the Lord who made heaven and earth. In our lesson for last week and this week, Jesus describes himself as being the bread of life. And he promised in our uh, um, John 6 and 35, that anyone who eats of him should not hunger, they would never hunger, and they would never thirst. Jesus promised, and his word is true. It said heaven and earth would pass away before any piece of his word would fail. So we can trust in the Lord, and we can look to the hills, because Jesus is our source. He is our sustenance. He is our strength. He is our savior. He is our redeemer. We can stand on his word because his word cannot fail. And know that in him we can have satisfaction. We can have contentment and not just feel full. We need to know. He is the source, and he is available to us 24-7, 365. What a blessing to know. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and we don't have to go hungry. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. We thank you, Lord, that we don't have to battle this, this journey alone, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that you promised that you would be with us until the end of the age. Father God, we thank you that you promised we would never have to go through this alone. We stand on your word, Lord God. We believe your word. We thank you, Lord God, that you promised that you are our bread. So we never have to go hungry. We never have to thirst because you are with us. Lord, we thank you. We honor you, Lord God. We praise you and we give you all the glory, all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week.